so my title this morning is The Purpose of Grace. On, Point number one is the mystery, the miracle. Okay. The mystery, the miracle. We're going to be starting in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. It says, for this reason I, so what was the reason he's saying, for all this grace, for all this, this, this mercy and this riches that I've gotten, God, for all that, this is what I'm doing from now on. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of the Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is, the mystery made known to me by re revelation, as I have already uh, written briefly. In reading this then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit of God's holy apostles and prophets. Just stopping there for a moment. What a way to start off and get us thinking. I remember reading these first five verses, and it, I'm getting hyped. I'm like, what? What is this mystery of Christ? Man, this sounds awesome. This is, this is something that must blow my mind. Something that nobody else really understood before all these other generations. And now we get to understand it? And I'm like preparing myself like this is going to be something I'm not going to understand. I'm pulling out my paper. I'm pulling out my pens. I'm like, I'm going to have to dig deep into this. Are we getting to some revelation kind of stuff? I don't know. Well, let's see what he says in verse 6. He says, this mystery is that through the Gospels, the Gentiles are heir together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Christ Jesus. So that's the mystery. <laughs> I had to read that over a couple of times. Because I, I, I read that and I was like, so the mystery is the church? Hmm. Pretty much that's what it is. He says the mystery is that now everybody can enter the church. That, 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 that's all it was. That, well, hey, everyone can now be a part of the church. Amen. Everyone is able to be saved. Oh, and I don't know about you, but I was expecting so much more, to be honest. <laughs> when I was reading this, I was like, a mystery, something I don't understand. Why? Because nowadays, we know that. We know that everyone can enter the church, that everyone's called to be saved. But I, I was just like, what's going on here? I kind of felt like, have you ever had that where... Someone's hyping you up. They're about to tell you a secret, but you already know the secret that they're telling you. Like they have like this new revelation, like, whoa, man, hey, I'm going to tell you what Cindy did last week. And you're like, what, what does Cindy do? And she starts telling you, like, I already know what Cindy did. But, you know, but in your mind, you got to, you got to make that like fake, like excited expression. Oh, whoa, Cindy did that. That's crazy. You know, and, and that's kind of how I felt. I was like, I was almost like, wait, this, I feel like I should have had so much more. But the thing about this is it's not hard to understand, but maybe it's a little bit hard to appreciate. Mm. And they, they, were, they were still understanding this, but nowadays, maybe, maybe we just don't appreciate this mystery. Mm. You know, the, the mystery was the miracle. See, again, they, they didn't see this as a mystery or a miracle. They actually saw this as a problem at this certain time. Oh, wow. it, it, Acts chapter 2 is when the church began. It wasn't until Acts chapter 10 that Peter was going out and, and saving Gentiles. And actually by Acts chapter 11, he had to explain why he was allowing Gentiles to come into the church. Yeah. Gentiles, what does that mean? That just means people who are not from the Jewish background. And so he had to explain this. It was a mystery to them. They only thought that salvation was for the Jews. And so they, they, they created this as a problem. That the church in, in Ephesus was now getting all these different Gentiles. And the Jews were like, well, they, they don't act like us. They don't believe in the same thing. They don't worship how we do. Mm -hmm. And they treated it as a problem. But he's like, no, this is a miracle. See, it's a mystery before, but this is, this is a blessing. I'm a prisoner of God because of this. This is by grace that this is happening. And so he was putting on their people's hearts, changing their minds. This wasn't a problem. This was the purposes of God. Mm. And to be honest, it can somewhat still be a mystery in many churches today yeah. that everyone is called to be saved. Mm. Why? Because you'll have churches that say, wait, what do you mean that? You're saying we shouldn't only allow islanders in our church? You're saying that we shouldn't only have an old white church or an old black church or an old this church or a young church or this? What, what do you mean? 
Th that's who I'm called to. Mm. No, that's not what the Bible calls. He says, everyone is to be saved. Yeah, you, you, you mean I should actually go out and help people to be saved? Mm -hmm. I can't just do a little sermon online and hopefully somebody clicks and subscribes. Mm -hmm. No, no, you got to actually be out there. And see, this is exactly where I was. This was a mystery to me most of my life. I, I grew up in church and I would hear the vague things of like, hey, let your light shine, you know, or that you're the only Bible that some people are going to read. Mm -hmm. And you, you have these things which are not bad sayings, but they kind of put on your heart of, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this passively. You know, I'm just going to live a good life and hopefully somebody's going to come up to me. And... This was a mystery to me that I actually had to go out and help people be saved. I remember the first time I was studying the Bible with people who actually had this on their heart. And they were talking to me of like, hey, we got to go out and share our faith and stuff. And I thought I was kind of treating them as I treated the other pastors before me in my life where, you know, they'll say something. I agree. No intention of doing it. Um, and so they're like, hey, we got to actually go out. And I was like, man. That sounds great. That, that's awesome. I love what you're talking about there. And they're like, what are you doing tomorrow? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, I'll find something to do. But no, I was like, <laughs> but like, what are you doing tomorrow? They picked me up from my high school, took me out onto one of the college campuses there, and we started sharing our faith. And that was the first time in my life where like my eyes were opened up to the ministry. What? I was like, whoa, well, that... We actually got to do this, <laughs> you know? And, and it wasn't just a, minute, a, a, a mystery to me anymore. It was a miracle. It actually helped change my life to not just think about myself, but to, giving, but to be giving to others. See, once you actually start putting this in action, that everyone has the ability to be saved, and it's part of our responsibility to see that through, mm -hmm. you realize that it's not going to be all that easy. <laughs> That it's going to be a lot harder than it sounds. I don't know if you ever got yourself into a situation where you think it's going to be easy to find out it's not. You know? I think I always underestimate my gym classes that I go to every week. Mm -hmm. So I go to like these hit classes, these pump classes. And I always go in there like, oh, I've been doing this for a few weeks. I should be leaving the class. Like, I got this now. But every single time... I'm always the person at the end that can like barely do one more push up and stuff. I always underestimate it. And then I always overestimate, it's kind of funny in my life, I always overestimate how long it takes to cook something. Um, every single time Tegan's like making eggs, I assume she's about to take an hour in the kitchen. Um, and I remember there's times where I ask her, well, how did you make it so fast? She's like, Sean, I microwaved it. <laughs> like, you know, I, it's like, it, it, I overestimate that as well. But I think there are people who really under estimate what it takes to keep a growing church unified. Mm. They, they totally underestimate that. They think it's going to be easy. That all we need to do is love God and love people. Now, yes, that is true. But how many of you have heard that in your heart? Is it, hey, just go love God and love people. And you just want to scream out to the person, I'm trying. Oh. <laughs> you know? That it's a lot harder than it looks. Yeah, well, what do you think I'm still doing here coming to church and reading my Bible and praying? I I'm trying with all my heart. It's a lot harder than it looks. Love God. Love people. Pray. Read. You know, I I've been a Christian for eight to nine to ten years. I'm still learning how not to hit snooze on my, on my phone. You know what I mean? It's, it's a lot harder than it sounds. And on top of all that, we're called to go and seek and save the lost and make disciples as Matthew 28, 18 through 20 tells us. You know, in the same way, we, we have to understand it's going to be a lot harder, but it doesn't mean just because it's difficult, we, we give up on it. You know, I can't tell you how many times I underestimate how hard it is to plan a small event. <laughs> um, even us just coming to church together with 10 people, th there are questions I didn't even know existed until I started planning things. <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't even know that these are things that people think about. You know, hey, do we take off our shoes? Do we leave on our socks? I'm like, I didn't even know that that's part of it. <laughs> and, and think about that, like how hard it is just to, just to even get us 10 people here for church yeah. this morning. There's so many little details. How hard is it going to be to organize a party in heaven with everybody invited? Wow. wow. <sighs> That's going to be hard. To get everyone to show up to heaven, 
How hard is it going to be to make sure that everyone RSVPs for the grace that God has given them? God has invited everybody. God's given grace to everybody. He's gifted it out to you. How hard is it going to be to see it through? See, I think why this is still a mystery and not seen that hard is I believe the religious world has made the gospel attractive to the world by making it easier. That, hey, it's, it's not that hard. You, just, you don't have to seek and save the lost. You don't need to repent. Just, just believe. And though they think that they're doing the world a favor and preaching grace, they've actually lowered the dosage of our spiritual medicine. They've lowered the dosage of what we really need to help change our lives. Wow. And so somebody may come in, they feel refreshed one day because they, you know, quote unquote, gave their life to God. But throughout their week, they're just they're slowly decaying because they haven't really been called to repentance mm -hmm. or really following God's vision for their lives. See, having God's vision in your life is one of the best things that can happen to you outside of having his grace. Having his vision for your life. It changes everything around you. You know, people have become so cynical of churches and things like that and, and dependent on our effort when actually we have now the opportunity to change the world. Just having God's vision. See, it says here in 1 John 5, 3, it says, In fact, this is love for God. To keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Yeah. To keep God's commands is awesome. It's amazing. It's like our rehabilitation from all the sin that we've gone through. Yes, we can have forgiveness, but to actually get out of that sin, to move through it, God has given us his vision in our lives. See, this mystery to the Jews about the salvation of the Gentiles was actually a miracle. They thought that they had God's vision. Salvation for the Jews. But, but they were wrong. They didn't really have God's vision. They were only looking at themselves. It's the same thing that can happen in our lives today. We think that we have God's vision when all we think about is our salvation and what we want. No, that, that's not God's vision. God's vision was for everyone to be saved. See, think about when the mystery of a vaccine of COVID gets discovered. It would cease to be a miracle if hidden. Mm. You know, it would be unnecessary misery for many people. Mm. And you would ask yourself, well, who would be so cruel if, if this mystery is discovered that they don't actually I invite other people along with it? Mm. Well, that's the same thing being done when church lose vision of God's of God's vision. Wow. They lose sight of God's vision. That this mystery is now shown to us. We have the vaccine. We have it. We have the miracle. Mm -hmm. But for us not to be able to go out there and help people to say, anybody can be saved. You stop doubting yourself. Stop looking down at yourself. Anybody can be saved. Then that mystery becomes the miracle. The first encouragement and challenge for this lesson is really seeing that the church, the, the, the unity and the, the bringing everybody together is now the miracle of God. That the miracle that we have is that people can come from all different places, sizes, races, whatever, and be unified all together under Christ's name. The first encouragement is join the miracle. Join the vision of what God's doing. Not about just membership, but actually join the miracle, not just the membership. Point number two, my pain, my pain, my pleasure. As we keep reading on, again, he's still having, hey, at, uh, for this reason, remember all this is because of the grace that's been given to him. So that's the that's reason Paul is doing all these things. But we continue on in verse 7 through 13. Again, for this reason, I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Though I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God, who created all things. His intent was now... Excuse me, was that now through the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purposes that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my suffering for you, which are your glory. So we get here in Paul's letter here and in his heart that Paul understood that his servitude to God was out of the grace that was gifted to him. We see that in verse 7. And to be honest, that can almost be a mystery in the church just as much as the other thing. Mm. Like, whoa, I'm, I'm a servant. I'm, I'm a prisoner. I'm a, I'm a worker of God. And not because I have to, but because of the grace that was given to me. So you're saying that, you know, it's not just these commands or what I obligations. It's like, whoa, this is, it's a blessing to work for God. That's almost a mystery in our hearts more than anything else, right? It's like, whoa, I get to do these things. Not I have to. It's, it's a grace given to me to work for God out of grace. And what he puts here on our hearts is just really starting to see that we have to stop treating God's commandments like they're a burden. So 1 John 5, 3, talking about they're, they're not burdensome. Yeah. These commandments are there to help you feel free, actually. They're, they're helping you in your life. And he was so excited to be a part of this historical change that's not just going to change how people viewed religion. This is going to change people's eternal life. Eternal salvation. And he says, how is this, how's the mystery going to be known? How are people going to understand this? That everyone can be saved. He says this in verse 10. Through the church, this is going to be done. Yeah. And then you think to yourself, oh, that's why I keep hanging out with these people. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, that's why we go to church all the time. Yes, it, it was part of God's plan that through the church, this miracle, this mystery was going to be known. And that's something that we actually have to change our mind about because through the church, Satan has also worked as well. Yeah. And we see Satan's plan through the church. We see churches and they have a, you know, they have the, the uh, I grew up in a church where it was about 3,000 strong. Not to say anything bad about their hearts or anything, but I grew up in a church where we had a basketball court. We had a, a, a like a cafe right there with coffee. We had like, you know, pool tables and all these things that all this money was spent on this. And you see churches around the world where, you know, they're asking you for more donations because their their jet is an old model now and they need the new model so they can save, save jet, you know, fuel and everything. And so we see through the church, we've seen some bad things. But we get back into the scripture of God what God intended. Mm. He says, through the church, this was going to be known. Wow. Again, God never meant for people just to have their salvation. It wasn't, when he went and died for us, it wasn't just, I want to give you your salvation. No, we're going to see, actually, in Jesus' uh, message about this mystery, is that his purpose was to create a new family of believers that were all accepting his message. Mm. See, church was not just added to the end of your salvation as a requirement. Oh, yeah, you should go to it or you should be a part of it. No, it, it was the purpose of your salvation. Mm. You getting saved was to be connected to his family. That was the main thing. He's saying it was now to join the Gentiles and the Jews. He was teaching them it was to make a new family. That, that was the purpose of their salvation, was so that they come and be part of the family. Stop treating them like strangers. They're part of our family. And it's the same thing here. Even when Jesus preached, he was talking about entering the kingdom of God, not individual salvation. He's talking about entering the kingdom. Here's a few examples in the book of Luke. Luke 4, verse 43. He said to them, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because this is why I was sent. Yeah. Okay. Luke 7, verse 28. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. John's awesome. John's amazing. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. Wow. Luke 8, 1. After this, Jesus traveled around from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Luke 9, 11. But the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them and spoke about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed healing. Luke 9.60 Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their dead, 
but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. See, the church, the kingdom, was not an addition. It was the main message. Come on, Sean. No church, no point of salvation. To not be a part of the body of Christ is to cease to be connected to the head. And that's what we kind of miss out. See, the truth is that, yeah, God died for us and we have to take responsibility of that. But it says here, even in the scripture that we read for, for, for Jess's communion, they died for the world. They died for everybody. And that's the truth. Yes, I can say Jesus died for me personally. He died for you personally because he had us on, in our minds and our sins. But his main, he died for the world. Mm. It was always a bigger picture. He never had an individual just, I, I want you just to be saved. Even Paul understood this. He says, hey, I'm going to get you to be saved. I'm going to make some things happen in your life. I'm going to get you blind. Three days later, you're going to be healed. But I'm going to show you how much you need to suffer for my name. Mm. You are now the apostles to the Gentiles. Go out there. Mm. And Paul understood this. He understood that his suffering was not just for his own salvation, but for the help of others. Wow. Come on. And I think that's why he wrote this scripture here in Romans 12, 3. For the, by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. See, Paul, he, had a, he was grateful for his salvation. He was grateful for the things that moved in his heart. He was grateful for him changing his life of killing Christians now to be one. But he saw himself, it wasn't about him. It was never about him. It was about building up the kingdom and helping other people be saved. He saw himself as a servant, a worker that was part of something bigger. And his pain and his suffering was for their glory. You know, people usually go through, excuse me, people that usually go through the most pain in this world do so for others. The stories that we hear of somebody doing something crazy and miraculous in the world are usually the people who are not going through pain for themselves, but for others and have others on their mind. Um, in a group in the church, we, uh, we have this young group, uh, the Warriors. And uh, each week, we'll usually go through, um, on Netflix, there's a series called Medal of Honor. And it's going through a couple people that have received the Medal of Honor, which is the highest kind of certificate you can receive in the American military. And there's one person that, as each episode shows a different person, there's only one name that I remember of the five or so episodes that we've seen. And his name is Edward Carter. And he's the only person I remember just because of how powerful his story was. He was fighting in World War II where America was actually still quite segregated. And he was a, a black American, African American, and he was fighting for, um, you know, fighting against Hitler, was, which was segregating and killing all these different people and discriminating. But yet it was interesting because even back in America, they said that uh, a segregated army was going to beat Hitler. That, that was the interesting thing about the history. Wow. And what was great about him is he was fighting for this, it was called Double V, which is pretty much v at, uh, victory at home and victory abroad, which is fighting for kind of uh, civil rights back home. But his story was amazing because there's this time where in his life, he, it was just him and there was this like, maybe about 200 yards out, there was about 10 German soldiers. They had like a couple machine guns out there and everything. And he, with this platoon of three other people, he's like, I'm going to go do this. Wow. And he ran out there. His three men died within like a minute. He gets shot up to, I believe it was five to seven times. And he kills all of them. And he takes two back. He spoke German and some other languages as well. Wow. And he was interrogating them, and he found out where all the other army was. Wow. And obviously, like, I don't know if all that is true or what details I have right or wrong, but I remember his name still, Edward Carter. Of everybody else that I heard, I was like, that, that guy loved so much. Mm. He wasn't doing it for himself. He wasn't doing it like even America at that time wasn't something to be glorified in what they were going on in their history. Mm -hmm. he, he had others in mind. He's like, I'm doing it for them. It's not about, I need to feel bad by myself. 
there's something going on over there in that country and I need to fight for, for justice. Mm -hmm. And guess what? When I get back home, I'm still going to be fighting for justice. But he had no pity and no looking at himself. And I was like, wow. That, 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 that guy, I, I want to honor his name, Edward Carter. See, I believe that in the same way, if we want to actually get the most out of our love that God has given us, we need to learn how to love others. See, Paul actually had a, a pretty comfy life before he became a Christian. You know? And now, after he became a Christian, he was on the receiving end of the sword that he used to wield. To the persecution and everything. He used to do that. And we can say the same thing about our lives. Have you ever done that? Like, man, before I became a Christian, it was kind of a little bit, at least less complicated. You know, most people actually don't want to join the church because of church drama, you know? And yet, he was saying the reason he was willing to suffer and go through these different pains, it was for their glory. He was willing to do it for them, not because of what he was going to gain from it. Wow, come on. And have you yet come to terms... As we join the church and get part of this mystery, have you yet come to terms with the pain that you face is going to be for the sake of others? It's not going to be for you. It has nothing to do with you. It's for the sake of others. And if not, then we don't really understand love. Because we even see in our parents, they love for this reason, right? You know, the kid doesn't do, the baby doesn't do anything for them. It's just simply for love that they're giving. And they have to do, you know, sleepless nights and everything for that. And guess what? God loves you this way as well. That he doesn't gain anything for him pouring his love out to you. It's nothing that he gains. He just gains someone else to love. He doesn't turn around and say, hey, look how much I've done for you. He's, he just loves us. My second challenge is to encourage you one time this week, I want you to pray through Matthew chapter 5 and the Beatitudes of really understanding the things that need to change our mind and how we view our lives and how we view a blessed life and change our minds that even when we're persecuted, we're blessed because we're doing this for others. Point number three and coming to a close, coming to a close in this chapter is go pray Come power. Come Go pray, come power. We're going to continue reading in Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. Again, he says, For this reason I kneel before the Father, for whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, every family, regardless of the Jews or Gentiles. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ. Mm -hmm. And to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. In all the 1,189 chapters of the Bible, excluding Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel 11, which mostly are describing um, visions that Daniel was having, Ephesians 3 has the most references to the word power. Of all of the Bible, other than those two chapters, this is the chapter that talks most about God's power and how closely it is to God's grace. How, how awesome is that? And God, and, excuse me, and Paul prayed that they would receive God's power. That this is not something that you can pass on to someone else, but it was simply going to be going through the Spirit as uh, verse 16 references. See, it must be given by God. Even in 2 Timothy 1.7, for the Spirit of God does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. Yeah. And so we remember that we've been talking about grace is just the beginning, and through the riches of His grace and mercy come His power. So then I, I think about this. Okay, why, if we already have God's grace and we have His mercy, why was it so important that Paul was driven to his knees that people would receive power? Why was it so important that people had power in their life? That they weren't timid Christians? That they weren't weak Christians? See, sometimes I think even we can see people are weak in the church and it doesn't drive us to our knees. We talk about it and say, oh, well, they're just going through something. Um, well, they're not going anywhere. They're not leaving. They're just, you know, a little bit weak. Uh, well, you just got to give them time. They're young. They're understanding. They're learning. 
But Paul was driven to his knees when he saw a weak Christian. Why? Well, because we, we read on here that it says it's so important because you won't be able to grasp the love of God unless you have power. It says here, I, I, I want them to be established and rooted in love, may have power through Christ, uh, through God's holy people, to grasp. They have to have power to grasp on God's love. See, it required power to understand the full love of God. You get established and rooted in His love when we get started a relationship with Him. But if we don't grow in our power, we'll never understand His love. And so that, that was on his heart. He's like, when he saw a weak Christian, he saw, man, they don't really understand God's love. How can they? We, God's love is not for the weak. Yeah, obviously he brings in the weak, but you've you got to have power to hold on to God's love. You know, to accept forgiveness, to let love move you and change your life, to actually see yourselves not as you see yourself or how others see you, but how God sees you. That, that takes strength. That takes power. And so that's what he was praying for these weak Christians. That's why he was brought to his knees. Every single person in the church needed this power. Mm. It was a difference between them feeling loved or not. Mm. It was a difference between them feeling loved or not. It wasn't just, oh, the preacher be powerful. The leaders be powerful. These guys. See, every single person needed that power. Mm. See, when someone's weak in the church, do we pray for them? Or do you get critical and look at them and wonder, what are they doing? <laughs> why, why do they act that way? Why are they weak that way? Why don't they just learn? Well, maybe they need you to pray for them. Again, if we are weak, if they are weak, they can't grasp God's love. So, so they don't really know about God's love, then what's the reason of them being a servant? You know, and yeah, you can't go up to them and tell them, hey, you need to do this and you need to correct that. But if they don't understand God's love, they're going to be doing it, but not out of an awesome, out of grace, grace heart. They just doing it. Mm. You know, have you ever been to like fast food or something and you know that person does not want to work there? <laughs> you, you can see it right on their face, right? This person does not want to be there. She does not want to take my order. She does not say have a good day, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, though she's doing it, you can see she doesn't want to be there. And it's the same thing. When people don't have God's power and God's grace, they can go through the motions, but you can tell when someone doesn't want to be there. When someone doesn't want to seek and save the lost. When someone doesn't want to put out all their heart. And so we have to pray for God's power. It continues re reading on here that there is, we have to pray that God gives him power. And guess what? He has so much power to give. In verse 20 through 21, one of these most amazing, encouraging scriptures says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than what we ask or imagine, according to his power that is work within us. He's not just like us leaders or us, us preachers. He's everybody. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, once you start to actually get to know somebody, you start asking deeper questions. You know, one of the deepest questions that you can ask somebody is, hey, if you were a superhero, what superpower would you want? That's, that's a deep question right there. Now, now, now you're digging deep. But, you know, you, you, we always ask that question. Like, well, what superhero do you want to be, right? And for me, I always want to teleport. You know, I think I would gain a lot of pounds because I would just teleport to Maccas and back. But, um, but I, that, that would kind of be my purpose. But it's awesome here. That you have actually one of the greatest superpowers. You have prayer. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Ephesians 20, 21. You, he, he can do immeasurably more than you can ask or imagine. That's the greatest superpower anybody can have. Mm -hmm. And he's simply just saying, you just simply need to pray about it. You need to pray that God fills the church with power. My last challenge is for everyone. I want you to pray for everyone. I want them to have power in their life. See, at the end of this... We now have a huge grandma serving of God's grace before yeah. us. A little bit too much that we, I don't know if I can understand all this. This is too much. I am rich right here. Come on, um, and there's no richer man, they say, than the one who has God's grace. Mm. But now we've also been God, given God's grace, that awesome platter right there. But now we've also been given some grandma chores. Yeah. There, there, there's some things. There's a purpose between this grace. There's a purpose of our salvation. 
how we see that it is to be connected, it is to be powerful, it is to actually to do God's purpose. See, His grace was given to everyone, and we have a responsibility to this. And we must pray for people to have the power of His servants. See, there's a purpose to God's grace. We've been given the portion. We've been given the power. And now it is time to make it a power hour. Woo! Thank you very much. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. You gotta preach, preach, preach the word. Out. You gotta preach. Preach the word, you gotta preach, preach, preach the word, you see I was lost before I was found in my pride.